Work addiction is actually my number one. And and one of the signs of work addiction is 110,000% and then boom, dead. Really? Yeah. But yeah, one of the signs of work addiction is also procrastination because we know how much of a toll it takes on our body that Uh, we anticipate it. And that's when my laziness is triggered, but it's really fear. Ah, interesting. You know, uh, when you're in your thousand percent mode, when you, you know, I'm a little manic actually when I'm, when I'm in inspired. Okay, you got painting and photos and food and design and decorating and producing and directing and editing. And sometimes I just, I get paralyzed. Do you ever try to uh, unravel what part is like being an artist and being creative and then what part is ego? Yeah, I mean, ego gets me to show up. Ego made it so I put lip balm on. But I also, you know, it's really helped me because it's been confusing to, you know, concretize and control it all. But I love the multiple intelligence theory. So How, Howard Gardner, I I begged him to do my podcast a few years ago. And he said, no. And I continued to beg. <laughs> I said, please, our generation needs you. <laughs> so he, he, he came on and we talked about the idea of there being multiple intelligences. So it takes the, oh, that person's smart or that person's dumb completely out of the equation. Okay. I mean, it's uh, physical uh, intelligence, musical intelligence, math, logic intelligence, naturalist intelligence is, a, is another one, gardening. I like that. Spatial intelligence. So, you know, if someone's really great at parkour, but maybe they're challenged with spelling or grammar and linguistic intelligence, you can no longer say, oh, that person's really smart. For me and our family, we have to qualify it now. So if someone says, wow, that person's a genius, I'll go, a genius how? Right. And Howard, bless him, I was audacious enough to say, can I add some? He said, yeah. And I, you know what? What I loved adding is the comedic intelligence. Because I really- To loneliness. It turns out that when we are chronically lonely, a couple of counterintuitive things happen to us. So one is that our threat level shifts up. So we start to perceive things around us as as a threat, whereas they may not be. The second thing that happens is our focus shifts inward because we're feeling unsafe. We're feeling under threat. And the third thing that happens to us is that our self-esteem starts to erode over time as we start to believe that the reason we're lonely must be that we're not likable. Or, wow. or broken in some way. And all of these constitute a downward spiral because the less self-esteem I have, the harder it is for me to reach out to other people. The more threatened I feel, the more I'm focused on myself, the harder it actually makes it for other people uh, to have a meaningful interaction with me. But service is powerful because it short circuits these patterns. It shifts the focus from me to someone else in the context of a positive interaction. But it also reaffirms for me that I have value to bring uh, to the world. And, and that feels good. The last thing I, I would share, and there's so many things that I learned from the beautiful stories that many of which I've included in the book that I think are powerful in addressing loneliness. But the last thing I would share is also a counterintuitive one. Uh, and that's that solitude is actually an important part of the solution to loneliness. And I'll explain why. So solitude is time that you spend alone that's joyful, that's peaceful, that's replenishing. And solitude is important because it's, it's in moments of solitude that we allow the noise around us to settle. It's where we allow ourselves to reflect on what's happening in our life, where we recenter and reground ourselves. And when you approach somebody else from a place of groundedness and centeredness, the conversations are usually better. You're able to listen more clearly to them. You're able to show up more clearly as yourself as opposed to trying to be somebody else that you're not. Those centering moments of solitude, they don't have to be seven-day retreats uh, that you take away from your family. Although if that works for you, you should absolutely do that. But we can find moments of solitude uh, in just a few minutes of time that we take to sit out on our stoop and feel the wind against our face or take a short walk in nature. It can be a few minutes that we take to remember three things that we're grateful for or that we take to meditate or to pray. These are all simple, small things that can have an immeasurable difference. I I learned this actually.